Welcome to Mom Jeans. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And whether you wear a boyfriend, boot cut, high rise, or low rise, this podcast is going to teach you to love the jeans you're in. So mamas, put your booty in a chair and let's get started. Hello, hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us on another episode. Today, we're talking about a pretty sensitive topic. We decided to take on the topic of fertility. And I know that fertility is a topic obviously important to all of us moms because, I mean, none of us would be moms without someone somewhere having a baby. Uh, We all have our story about how we got pregnant, how quickly we got pregnant. If we had trouble getting pregnant, if we had some major infertility issues, if we used surrogacy or adoption or sperm banks, I mean, the list goes on. The process of having a baby, becoming a mom is such a big topic. There are literally entire podcasts out there dedicated to just this topic. So we can't dive into all of it and we're really not qualified to. This is not Tina and I's area of expertise. But we wanted to touch on it today because we hear a lot of feedback from people about how the pregnancy, fertility, infertility treatments, and all of that journey really affect body image. So we're going to just focus on fertility and body image and kind of keep it in that space. Yeah, this topic is a bit difficult for both Rachel and myself to talk about. And the reason for that is that we both feel somewhat guilty for not personally struggling with infertility. Obviously, we know this is entirely outside of our control, but topics such as body size and fertility is exactly the point of all of this. Fertility is out of our control. Secondly, we both know a lot of people who have gone through this or are still going through fertility treatments many very close to home, and to watch the struggle is honestly very challenging. I feel fortunate to not have to struggle with this, but I feel that this episode is so very important, and I want to spread the positive vibes out there to the mamas that are struggling with for infertility and for those that are getting shamed in the process. Yeah, we're going to do our best to be respectful of this topic. So we actually want to do more listening than talking. So we brought on an amazing fat activist and fertility expert to discuss some of the myths of infertility and body size and weight, the how to accept your body as you navigate this process. And she also has some great resources to support mamas out there who are struggling with this process. So Tina and I are going to start off this episode a little bit with some basic research on fertility and infertility, and then we're going to get to our interview. We are going to chat today about fertility in our body. Not all of it is going to be positive because there is the real topic that medical professionals shame those that are living in a larger body, and this is happening with fertility treatments too. This topic idea started for us as we listened to our mom friends discuss the side effects on their bodies and their mental health as they navigated fertility treatments. I've had friends share the fact that depression is overwhelming as you go through the infertility treatments, not just from the emotions of needing fertility treatments to get pregnant, but also the high levels of hormones. I mean, I've had some of the most positive, happy-go-lucky friends become borderline suicidal, and I don't say that lightly. I've also seen them struggle with their weight changing and going up without anything else in their lives changing except hormone treatments. I had a wonderful friend who told me once, to now have to wrestle with body acceptance on top of everything else just feels cruel. She just felt it brought up so much that she had never dealt with or thought maybe she had dealt with or wasn't really prepared to also deal with. And so this brought up another psychological piece to unpack. Uh, recently in the media, the show This Is Us featured Christy Metz's character talking to a fertility doctor, and it just showed the fertility doctor's cold reaction to taking her on due to her weight, which is something we're going to talk about in our interview today. And then we also are going to reference and link a New York Times article that quoted personal stories mixed with data on is there actually a correlation between body size and the ability to get pregnant. So that's kind of a little background to our story of why we're going to go through this episode today and then where we're going to take you in this episode. Yeah, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that article that we're going to link in the show notes. Basically, a 
summary of that article is that it's this family's struggle into their fertility and coming into contact with doctors that are that were basically saying that they weren't willing to treat them as a family until this mom lost weight um, to a certain BMI standard. Um, One of the quotes in the article that really rang deep for me was when you're fat, you get used to people assuming weight loss will fix everything wrong in your life. And I think that really hits home for the weight normative approach that all these medical professionals, including fertility professionals, are judging individuals based off of their BMI. If you think back to the episodes we recorded about your weight, we discussed the research around weight and how it is not a great marker of your health, and it's not the cause for health issues. When we think about this, a great therapist friend of mine has given me a great analogy, and she gave me permission to share her analogy, and I think it's just awesome. So This is an example of how correlation is not causation. So basically she says how in the summer, ice cream sales increase, but so does murder. So basically, if we're going based off of correlation causes causation, so you're telling me that either ice cream, people who eat ice cream are also murderers or murderers in the summer really crave ice cream. (laughs) The two aren't connected. I mean, I don't know. I think my kids might murder me if I don't let them go to the ice cream truck. There might be a correlation. Right? (laughs) Yeah. So when she shared with me that analogy, I'm like, holy shit, that's amazing. Because it's true. It's like, so you're telling me that just because weight gain happens And so does the disease that one is cause for the other. And no, correlation is not causation. So what does this have to do with fertility? Well, why does our healthcare system assume that because someone is living in a larger body or smaller body that they will not be able to conceive? I didn't realize that your uterus stopped producing eggs just because you were a certain body size. And it doesn't. I heard another analogy that was like, just because all your organs are down there smooshed together doesn't mean they're connected. Like your reproductive system and your digestive system are separate. Yes. I thought that was kind of an <laughs> interesting thought. <laughs> and you know what? I really, this is going to sound so silly and maybe other people can relate to me on this. I didn't really know the ins and outs of the reproduction reproductive system until I actually got pregnant and I'm like wait a minute where's the placenta attached how did the eggs get released what tubes did they go down so you know I think we can all use a little bit more education and awareness around that so yeah the digestive tract and uterus and our reproductive system are not connected so or they're connected they're just not in the same space so relating back to the New York Times article If someone would have dug a bit deeper with one of the moms about their behaviors around their health, their daily routine, their sleep, and then maybe they would have actually been able to help them versus just saying, hey, you need to get to this BMI before we're actually going to treat you. This poor woman had to suffer with that for years. And the other part that I have a problem with is that the individuals are being turned away from treatment just because someone else is judging their body. In this article, there are some research studies that show body size does affect ovulation, but the problem I have with these studies are that there are so many other factors that can contribute to this. There is not a strong way to actually control the participants. I'm not a research expert, so I'm not going to pretend that I am, but unless all factors can be controlled, how are people actually connecting it all to the weight? Yeah, this article ties us back to the weight normative versus weight inclusive definitions we gave you in the Your Weight episode as well, because like Tina said, many infertility clinics and doctors are actually refusing treatment to clients based on their BMI. Now, you know how we feel that BMI is BS, and the fact that people are downright being refused treatment for me, it's just plain wrong and unethical. I don't know the ethics codes for doctors, but for me, this feels unethical. I mean, not to be insensitive or compare, but can you imagine if you went to the oncologist and they refused to do cancer treatments due to BMI? I just think people would be up in arms. 
I think so many women feel shame about their weight, thanks to our lovely critical diet industry, that I wonder if women are just believing this is truth and allowing themselves to be treated this way and not advocating for themselves or what's going on here. And so I'm really excited that we have our interview today because she is going to be talking to us a little bit about exactly what's going on with all of this. Okay, awesome. Let's get to our interview. We are interviewing Nicola Salmon. Nicola is a fat positive and feminist fertility coach and author of Fat and Fertile. She advocates for change in how fat people are treated whilst accessing help in their fertility. Nicola supports fat people who want to get pregnant using their unique fat positive fertility framework to find their own version of health without diets, advocate for their bodies, relearn how to trust their body, and believe in their ability to get pregnant in their current body. Let's get to it. All right. Well, welcome to our episode. Thank you so much for joining. And could you please introduce yourself and say your name and tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're talking to us today about fertility? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful. Um, my name's Nicola Salmon. I live in London with my two boys. They're three and five. Um, and I was diagnosed with PCOS at 16. Uh, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is like a hormonal and metabolic condition and told by my doctor that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. So that's kind of where my journey started. Um, expecting through my whole teens and my 20s that I would really struggle to get pregnant and become a mum. But it didn't work out like that. We got pregnant with both my boys super easily. And kind of through all that time, I was told that dieting and weight loss was the thing that was going to help with my PCOS. So I spent all that time dieting and yo-yo dieting and putting my body through crazy stuff just to try and make it smaller. And then I got to kind of this non-diet approach, which is kind of through the fertility stuff that I was talking about. Because eventually when I had my children, I realized that I didn't want to pass on all this crap that I had around food, all this stuff that I said about my body, you know, out loud and in my head. And um, I just I had to draw a line because I did not want my sons hearing that, absorbing that, thinking that was okay. Um, so yeah, so that kind of triggered this whole journey into learning what it was like to be a fat woman who wasn't dieting. And it led me to learning about health every size movement, intuitive eating, and find this incredible community of people like yourselves who are trying to change the diet culture that we live in, you know, the soup that we're in, mm -hmm. immersed in every day. And it's, yeah, it's changed my life. Yeah, that's awesome. The dietitian in me is like, screaming when you're like yeah they tell me that I'm not gonna be able to have babies with a PCOS diagnosis and then they tell me to diet and lose weight and I'm like no <laughs> but yay I'm glad you found the actual other end of like you don't have to do that that's that's not how we treat PCOS you know mm, diet and weight loss is no it. no yeah yeah so Tina and I, Tina and I were joking in our intro before you got on the call about how I had heard this, you know, little joke like, just because your reproductive system and your um, digestive system are in the same location doesn't mean they're connected. <laughs> so they don't necessarily need to be treated like that. So what is some of the thoughts that people have of why people should lose weight or have a lower BMI in order to help them get pregnant. Like, can you explain some of the like things that your doctors have said, or you've heard women be told? Oh my gosh. There are so many reasons for it. Um, the first one around the PCOS link is that they talk about this kind of, we know that there's a correlation between like, you know, weight gain and um, lack of ovulation, but they talk about it as a causation mm -hmm. so that, if you lose weight, then you'll get your ovulation back, which is obviously really important when you're trying to get pregnant. Um, but there's so many other reasons that doctors um, and healthcare professionals come out with. Um, even things like, well, it's really bad for your unborn children if you try and get pregnant when you're in a bigger body, because then that's going to get pregnant. You know, all these things like, but it's for your health. But it's, you know, it's we're doing it for your benefit when actually it's just a lot of fat phobic rhetoric. For sure. So for me, I just think, you know, just on based on my experience that can't be right 
and I'm not sure where they're getting all these stats from, unless they're, like you're saying, fat phobic, and so they're twisting the stats to have it be more about causation rather than correlation. Is that your experience? Mm, that's totally it. I mean, all the research out there doesn't take into account things like weight cycling. So the people on all the studies, chances are, are going to be dieting or have been dieting very recently in their past. And also the weight bias. So the, the fact that these people who are going to see their healthcare professionals will have had less support, shorter appointment times. Um, they will not have had treatment as quickly, you know, mm -hmm. all these things and the internalized bias that these women are going to be experiencing that they won't go and see their doctor as quickly because they're going to get fat shamed, which is yep. just. Oh. And I love that you touch on that because in one of our, the last episodes that we did talking about your, it's called your weight, where we talk about the weight normative approach and the struggles that individuals face as a result of that. So like not being able to feel comfortable going into their doctors or not having the best health care that they can have because of that stigma and shame. So mm -hmm. I love that you bring that up because not only is that happening just with general health care, but also fertility as well. So, so as a coach, what do you think gets in the way of women advocating more for themselves when they are told they need to lose weight to be treated for fertility? or to get pregnant? So I think the first thing that people um, believe about it is that they can't say, you know, anything because they're going into this appointment already worried, already panicking about the conversation that they believe is going to play out, which often does around their weight, around their kind of lifestyle and their health. They almost kind of go in in this, on this back foot of, you know, being frightened of what's going to happen. And they don't, they don't necessarily go into it believing that they ha they can have a say and that they can have an opinion and that they have a choice around their own health care. Mm -hmm. And I think empowering people to know that they can go in and make these informed decisions and, you know, consent to their own medical treatment, I think is such a big step for yeah. so many people. Yeah. Well, Rachel, I'm going to throw this to you. Like, as a therapist, what would you – how do you support individuals in advocating for themselves? Yeah. No, because the number one thing I hear Nicola saying is like a woman's psyche is her own worst enemy at that point. You know, the do sure, the doctors are not being helpful. I don't use the word enemy, but but at the same time, our own personal shame about our bodies or our own personal just low self-worth and low self-confidence is a huge obstacle. And we kind of forget that we have to address that maybe first, before we can then advocate for ourselves. And this happens whether or not we're women and talking to fertility doctors, but I think this also happens as moms. We feel like we're doing something wrong. The doctor says our baby's healthy or maybe not. And we're going, I think there's something off here. Like, I think, should I seek another doctor? Should I get a second opinion? And But we all, as women, I think, get so scared into silence because we have maybe these preconceived notions about ourselves or we feel like there's preconceived notions about us as women and I think the whole thing just gets really confusing so I think it's interesting that you're almost you're not a doctor but you're a coach and that's exactly what people need because we need to help support their their psychological well-being and support all of their self-worth issues and insecurities they're getting in their own way like that is a big first obstacle it sounds like you're saying to to jump over in order to even get in to a doctor. Mm. Well, I think, you know, the only the only things that we can change are our own actions and our own thoughts around that. We can't mm -hmm. change what the doctor's going to say, you know, you know, the systemic problems going on that we can't address quickly. For sure. So I think definitely making that first, you know, being able to really change kind of the thought patterns that go in your head and this kind of mental chatter of you know my body's not good enough I need to lose weight you know all these things about my body is broken I think changing that can have such a positive impact on your mental health and then it gives you the confidence then going into those appointments to know that okay you know you might cry in an appointment and that's okay or you might slip over your words or you might you know have so many difficult it's a difficult conversation and it takes a lot of emotional energy but having that confidence at least in yourself a little bit is the only way that you're going to be able to have those difficult conversations and get this treatment and the support that you are entitled to and that you deserve for sure yeah like from a dietitian standpoint it's like even if I try to 
Like I know the client's going to go into whatever doctor and I try to protect that client. Call ahead, tell the doctor, this is the approach that we're using. Please do not weigh the client. Please do not bring up weight loss. This is what I'm working with them on. Even if I set up the biggest safety net as protection and the doctor either honors it, don't doesn't honor it, it's like, it's exactly what you're saying. The only thing that we can really control in this equation is our own self-dialogue. And really, if a doctor does respond in a way that is ignorant or weight normative, then we have to be able to use our skills, the support, the connections that we have to be able to move through that. Not being easy, you know, but I love that you kind of touched on that. So Yeah, I do too. My my new favorite quote that I heard was, speak your truth even if your voice shakes. Mm. Ooh. And I just thought that was so beautiful because a lot of this is going, no, this is my truth. My truth is that I actually do trust my body or I think my body is telling me that I'm okay right now or, or something along those lines. Or I think my body's saying there's something wrong, but it's not my weight. It's something different. Any way that woman can kind of, I think, own her truth and really do some of that deep intuitive work and then find her voice, even if it's shaky, even if it's through tears to really speak that truth and say, no, I, I have a right to request this type of health care. Mm-hmm. And even for like, you know, for example, like if you have a heterosexual couple going into a fertility clinic, often the weight will be blamed even if there's a problem with the partner, you know, even if there's a sperm factor going on. Mm-hmm. And that's so frustrating because the woman could be completely healthy. There could yep. be absolutely nothing going on, yet they're still telling her to diet and to lose weight when there's, you know, when IVF is going to be the course of treatment because of the problem with the sperm, it's just infuriating. For oh, sure. That's awful. Yeah. And that's if they get to the clinic in the first place because of the BMI barriers that they put in place. Right. So since you've now learned this message about anti-diet and health at every size, how did you learn to take care of yourself and nourish yourself without focusing on weight? And then how do you encourage your clients to do that? So for me, it started with two promises that I made to myself. The first was that I wasn't going to weigh myself anymore. And the second was that I wasn't going to diet again. And those are some things that I've really stuck with over kind of, gosh, five years now. Mm -hmm. And then it was just about learning. And it was a rough road. I'm not going to say it was easy for me because I only discovered like health every size a couple of years ago. So the first three years, I was really just trying to navigate how to be a person in a big body and and not be like automatically saying yeah I'm trying this diet or yeah I'm going down this road to exercise um one of the biggest things for me is about um being around intention so really deciding with intention you know I want to move my body but how does that look when I'm not trying to punish it and how does that look when I'm not trying to make it smaller and finding things that I really love to do and that's made things way more easy for me to be consistent with things totally improve my mental health Um, And just, yeah, about finding things that really matter to me and that really bring me joy and really make my life better. Because with small kids, you know, like, I don't have that much time to myself, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't have that much time when I'm not working or being a mom. So those times that I have time for me, I've been so intentional about making sure they're things that really light me up and really nourish me. Mm -hmm. I love that. How do you encourage then others to love their body or move through that same journey even when they're having trouble getting pregnant or having body acceptance or eating intuitively? Mm, So I take it away from the weight loss and the dieting thing, which a lot of people have never, never really looked at their health without thinking about it as a weight loss kind of number that they have to aim for. Right. And um, I do this exercise with people where we really look at what their priorities are in terms of all their different areas of health. So like, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial relationships, you know, all different areas, which, you know, they may not necessarily see as important for their fertility, but so often, like, you know, we're whole beings, it's really important to take like a whole approach as to kind of what you're looking at in terms of your health. Mm -hmm. And then looking at kind of where their priorities are, where their needs maybe aren't being met, and what's going to be the things that made the biggest impact for them, and what that looks like for Mm -hmm. them. So meeting them where they're at, and just really making sure that we take them from where exactly where they are right now taking tiny steps just to get them to where they want to be because 
people's health looks and what they want from their health looks so different from person to person you know one person's aspiration of health is going to look so different from another's and I think we need to embrace the fact that it's going to be different it's not going to be our version of health and we need to just help them reach what their success looks like Mm -hmm. right I like that. It's a whole body approach at that point or a whole person approach. If you're looking at the financial piece and the relationship piece, Mm -hmm. it's almost like this is a good opportunity for someone to go, oh, I hit this roadblock that is making me actually stop and take a full assessment of everything and learn how to love my whole person and take care of my whole person and also then focus on hopefully getting pregnant. Do you have people do all of that first? and put almost the pregnancy goal on hold? Oh, sometimes. I mean, people have, like, taken the coaching and started businesses, you know, like, completely done things that they maybe didn't consider doing just because we've talked about, you know, what is going to make you happy and what's going to light you up and how does that look? And, you know, they've taken radical approaches to changing their life because I think when you're on a fertility, you know, a journey with that, often you can put everything else on hold. So people will stay in jobs because they're afraid to move on. Um, People will, you know, not put as much into their relationships because they're, you know, it kind of becomes this hyper focus of I must get pregnant, I must get pregnant and everything around you kind of focuses on that. But when you kind of take it out of that and kind of, you know, talk about health in a broader sense, then people really can start to look at their life as a, you know, a puzzle piece again. And it's not just this one big fertility puzzle piece. It's all these other things combined. And, you know, I talk about fertility. It's not this separate system like we see it in the, in the textbooks of like, it just setting, sitting on its own. It's surrounded by your whole body and your whole body is surrounded by your environment and all the things that intertwine into that. And everything impacts everything else. It's not just sitting there quietly on its own, doing its thing, you know, everything around you, your, environment you know the the social position you're in in culture and you know so many things impact on health it's not just the foods we eat and the way we move our body so it's taking that bigger picture is really important for sure I think what you're talking about is helping people focus on their mental health in a broader scope and when I have heard my friends talk about their fertility journey and when I've walked with friends through some of the darkness I've really seen their mental health be impacted because not only they're trying to hold on to this goal of getting pregnant and feeling so out of control and so desperate because their mama clock is ticking and they want that baby and so it's just a huge complicated factor of their mental health but now they're having to simultaneously hold on to this goal of weight loss thanks to their weight normative doctor's advice or now they're trying to figure out well I'm kind of hating my body because it's not getting pregnant right away but now I'm also hating my body for its pant size like it just feels like that's got to have an additional layer on a woman's mental health and I'm I'm curious your thoughts on that oh I mean it's it really is just this horrible downward spiral because these people have you know like majority of people I work with they have been on this yo-yo roller coaster dieting thing their whole lives and they've never really come to terms and you know never found a place of acceptance with their body and they feel like their body's failed them so often and then they layer on this fertility piece of okay well now this means that I can't get pregnant and in our society we're told that weight is controllable so we're told that this is something we can control and it's within our responsibility to be able to change our weight even though that's completely not true but then it's like well the reason that you can't get pregnant is solely your responsibility so it's completely your fault and that just you know it shatters people it breaks people beyond you know it's just this you know because like you said like this mum thing is just something that drives you it's this core feeling of like it's something that you cannot control this desire to be a mom it's just something that is within you and raw and deep and it's it can feel like your life is over if this is something that you feel that may be out of your grasp and for that then to be well it's your fault and everybody tells you that it just breaks your heart right I mean we hit on that earlier in this episode where we had said like we want everyone to realize that this is out of your control it is it is not as simple as just do this and then it's done you know and so you're like singing songs I love it it's it's yeah it is out of our control I have seen a few friends be in bodies that 
they didn't necessarily struggle with their body acceptance. They're in maybe thinner bodies or more just bodies that they were like, they didn't have an issue with them kind of deal. <laughs> um, and then they've gone on, on all the infertility hormone treatments and they've had weight gain as a result. And now they're having this complicated layer of, wow, I've never really struggled with body acceptance, but now I'm having to do a lot of interesting, deep work about my new body and my new mom bod, even though I'm not even pregnant yet. And now I have infertility. So I've seen a lot of friends kind of face it from that angle. And I'm curious if you work with clients who have had that dynamic. It's really, really common for people to, for people's weight to change as they're on these drugs, because these drugs are like a hammer to your endocrine system. They are so like, they are hardcore stuff and they can send you to places that you would never expect Mm -hmm. emotionally and physically. This is not an easy treatment to go down by any stretch of the imagination. And it, yeah, I mean, if you consider that you're already emotionally drained from, you know, trying for however long that you've been trying to get pregnant, then you've been on these hormones for months um, and they completely mess up with your mental frame of mind. Like you can just take you crazy places and then your body's changing this in it, you know, obviously in our culture for people who have weight normative doctors, that means that they're more unhealthy and then they're like, oh crap, you know, I need to get pregnant, but now I'm in a bigger body. This must mean that um, it's going to be harder for me to get pregnant. And it just takes you down this whole kind of mm-hmm. mental roller coaster even further than you were already before. So it's, there is just no place in our society of where these people can go to get that support of like bringing them back down and going, you know, this is going to be okay. You know, your weight is not going to impact this. It's just a really normal side effect of the procedure you know, we really need to be taking care of people's mental health better through this process. Right. From a dietitian standpoint, it's like, and at the same time, if we restrict our food and force our body to change, you're not doing a healthy thing. You're actually causing more stress to your body, more stress to your mental health. Let's, you know, the, the best advice from a dietary standpoint would be continue to eat and nourish your body and let your body do its thing. Um, Then like hearing you talk about this, I'm like, I don't want to like identify this person, but I have an individual that is close to me that has been going through fertility treatments and struggling just with body change, kind of Rachel, what you're saying. And, you know, even though I work in the mental health field, it's like, this is so close to home that then what do you recommend for a support person that's not going through it, that isn't part of the support team, quote unquote, like professional support team? How can people help them? That's a good question. How can you be a good friend in that process? Because I haven't gone through it and I can't pretend that I get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a really difficult place to be in because – you want to give them as much support and love and, you know, attention as you possibly can because this is such a crap time to be going through. But at the same time, they might need space because, mm-hmm. you know, especially for mums, you know, hearing about kids and you always talk about your kids and that's nothing, you know, like they want to hear about it, but sometimes they're in a place where that can be triggering for them. And it's hard for us as mums to know when that trigger is because it will change for them you know sometimes they'll be great to come to a baby shower and they'll embrace it and they'll love it and they'll get excited and sometimes that is the last place they want to be you know whether they've just suffered a loss or whether they're you know they're tr- mid-treatment and they just feel like crap you know there's so many places on this journey where it's different and they're going to be in a different mental headspace so I yeah. think as a support person I think just letting them know that you're there that you are happy to listen um and just yeah, trying. It's so easy to be like, no, it's going to be okay. And you know, everything's going to be all right. But um, if you, you know, can just relax, you know, all these things that people say that to try and be supportive and to try and help, but really they, you know, you don't know if it's going to be okay. And you don't know if it's going to work out okay, because sometimes it doesn't. So it's yeah. just about completely being open and say, you know, I'm here, whatever you need, tell me it's crap. It's okay that you feel like crap now. It's, you know, you can come here and be crap and that's cool. You know, like, it's just honoring them in the space that they're in at that particular time. And, you know, like, if you want to do practical things like cook them a meal or, like, you know, just be there and, you know, like, 
whatever they need practically For sure. sometimes they just won't feel like cooking or sometimes they just want to go out and get drunk once they've had a cycle that's failed and <laughs> because you know we're told oh you can't drink or you can't have coffee yeah. all these limits like, screw stuff. that For give sure. me some wine yeah. <laughs> if it's crap you know if they've just had a, a negative pregnancy test then they're maybe yeah. going to want to go out and get drunk and you know it's just like being <laughs> yeah just go with what they want and just be open and ready to support them in whatever they need for sure that's helpful I mean it really just sounds like hey just be a good friend good a good person yeah Yeah, like but I think also just because this is the type of friends Tina and I happen to be because of our careers I think also being a friend who's saying like hey stop beating yourself up for like the weight changes or the body changes or maybe even being a friend who's also holding an anti-diet body love piece Yes. Because they won't be getting that word from anywhere else. Right, or... right. So my question was, what is your favorite fat... Mer- I can't say that right. What is your favorite fat fertility myth to bust? So my favorite myth is that fat people can have healthy pregnancies. Because so many times we are told that you're going to get gestational diabetes, you're going to you know, oh have gosh. a loss, or you're going to have to have a C-section. All these things are said, like I had two high-risk pregnancies in a bigger body, um, and they were all, I was led to believe that these were all inevitables. These were all going to happen to me. Um, chances like, you know, these are really things that are going to be really highly likely to happen, and they didn't. Um, and, you know, your body is capable of having a healthy pregnancy, And even if these complications arise for you, that doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It doesn't mean that your body is bad because they happen to everybody in every size, in every size body. So I think it's just, yeah, really important for people to understand that you can have a completely healthy pregnancy and healthy children, no matter what your doctor says about, you know, this increasing risks of crazy stuff happening to your kids, you know, like it's you know chances are that it's gonna be absolutely fine and you're gonna just sail through it like everybody else in every other size body and if things do happen it doesn't mean it's your fault it just it's just one of those things and these things happen to everybody in every size and it's not because you are in a bigger body yeah it it dings on our whole point of this podcast that a lot of those risks that you listed those are genetics that's genetics it isn't body size it's really what genetic line is happening like hitting on the gestational diabetes that is a genetic thing that's not about whether or not you're eating too many carbs in your pregnancy like what how no no it is if your dna is set up that way and something triggers it and boop you have it and guess what then it resolves itself once the pregnancy you know, once you give birth, you know, or the pregnancy, I don't know how to politely say that, you know, it's like, once it's over, the diabetes goes away. So like, as you're saying that, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. It's, it's, it's the point of our podcast. It's genetics plays such a strong role in Mm. so much of this that we can't, we cannot blame it on the weight. It's the weight is not. And to your, and to your point about loss i mean the miscarriage rate is one in four it's not like there's an asterisk that says unless you're at this bmi and then yeah whatever i mean i had a pregnancy loss i one of four like i think that it just happens to everybody because of just genetics like some embryos just aren't viable and so that is nothing to do with the number on the scale so what are some of your favorite resources articles whatever podcasts that you like to share with listeners so that they can become more educated or dig into so some of that not, there's not a lot out there i'm gonna be honest okay. um virginia soul smith wrote a really good article in the new york times quite recently it was this year and it was called um when you're too fat to get pregnant so i definitely recommend checking that out um a couple of people to um i definitely recommend checking out our plus mommy jen and um, she does a really good uh blog instagram account around generally it's around get, being pregnant in a bigger body but she has so many resources and um julie duffy dylan does a podcast around pcos in yeah. an anti-diet way which is really good and then i've written a book called fat and fertile which is on amazon now so but there is we just need more people talking about this we need more resources on it because there isn't just there just isn't enough out there and there's just not enough people talking about this yeah 
We will definitely link all of that in the show notes so everyone can kind of find that. Um, And those are great, great resources. Yeah, I'm so glad you're out there and talking about this because it is it's such an important topic. Thank you so much for doing this work. So can you tell our listeners where they can find you and hear you? Yeah. So I am mainly on Instagram and my Instagram handle is Fat Positive Fertility. Also on Facebook, the same name, Fat Positive Fertility. And my website is nicholasalmon.co.uk. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations on the book. That is a huge accomplishment. Yes. That, that's one of my dreams. And I don't know if it's ever going to happen. So I give you so much credit for that, especially with young kids. I don't know how you've informed sentences, let alone on paper. <laughs> it was a big, it was a big steep curve. Uh-huh. Um, and I yeah. self-published as well. So there's definitely a few typos wow. in there. Wow. Oh, I love it. I got it out. And that's, you know, for me, that was the most important thing. You know, if it reaches people in a way that maybe they wouldn't have seen my work before, that is what matters to me. That's awesome. Good job, mama. You're a badass. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this yeah. and for Thank you. With do you have us. any other thoughts that you would want to share with our listeners or do you have any other things? Um, one final thought, which I love to share every time I talk on a podcast is just about worth because so many people feel like they are not worthy of becoming a mother because of their size. And I just want you to know if you are listening to this, that you are totally worthy of being a mom no matter what your body size looks like no matter how you feel about your body no matter what your doctor has told you you are worthy of becoming a mom that's so beautiful i got goosebumps i am i'm i'm hormonal so i almost cried (laughs) (laughs) oh that's beautiful i i love i love that thank you for taking up this space in the world that's talking about this it's such a sacred space and i really am so grateful that you're that you're talking about it and i hope I hope our listeners feel encouraged by this and can find you and connect with you and maybe even use your coaching. That would be amazing. Yeah. We just want to say thank you so much to Nicola for chatting with us. And here's your takeaway for today's episode. How can you, if you are going through fertility, how can you as a mama tap into that worthiness that Nicola was talking about? Or if you aren't going through it, but someone you know is, how can you tap into some of the skills that Nicola had shared as a support person? As always, we thank you all for listening. We appreciate the support and we will see you next time. Thank you. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LaVoy. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans The Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom Jeans. See you next time.